All right, good evening. I'd like to call to order the Lakewood City Council special meeting in Lakewood, Colorado on Monday, August 7th, 2023 at 6 p.m. This is a virtual meeting. Uh, in order to join that meeting, the telephone number is going to be 720-707-2699. And the webinar ID is the same for that dial-in as well as um, for Zoom. And that's going to be 820-6281-3086. Again, the webinar ID is 820-6281-3086. Eight six. With that, will the clerk please call the roll? Paul. Here. Abel. William. Here. Counselor. Franks. Here. Jansen. Here. Mia Carrera. Here. Oliver. Here. Charizai. Here. Springsteen. Here. Stewart. Here. Strom. Here. And Vincent. Here. Mayor Paul, you have a quorum. Okay, great. Thanks. I'd like to quickly just state our statement of conflict of interest. If any members have any uh, personal financial or business interest, please feel free to say so, or council is able to um, exclude that as well. I have two hands up. Councillor Stewart. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Paul, I'd like to make a motion to recess into an executive session for a conference with the city attorney for the purposes of receiving legal advice on specific questions under the Colorado revised statutes 24-6-402 parents for parents B and Lakewood Municipal Charter 2.15 parents C parents for focusing upon legal issues arising out of HB 23-1255. Okay, we have a motion to go into an executive session to re receive legal advice based upon what's coming later on in the evening. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion as to the actual motion that Councillor Stewart has made? Okay, Councillor Abel. You are muted, sir. Councillor Abel, you're muted. Thank you. Again, this is the public's business, the public passed this uh, initiative that we'll be discussing tonight and a very uh, um, a widely discussed vote, uh, and I think that our discussions about the public's business belong in public. Thank you. I'll Councilor. be voting against the motions. Okay. Councilor Olver to the motion. Yes. Uh, could uh, Council Member Stewart explain why we should go to secret session as opposed to having it in public? Because I'm also, I'm, I tend to believe that the more people that see what we're doing, the better your governments will work. So if you have, but if you have a really good, a good reason for it, I, I certainly will listen. Councilor Stewart. Sure, thank you. I would be happy to uh, provide an explanation. I absolutely agree. I think that the, uh, <clears throat> the city's business should be conducted in public as much as possible. Um, and I do want to clarify that in executive sessions, no votes happen uh, for that very reason. Um, my concern is that we can't receive a lot of legal advice in a public meeting right now because of the delicate legal nature um, of this situation. And so I would love for us as a council to just be able to get, um, you know, 
the the take of our legal counsel from our city attorney before we make any sorts of decisions. And I know that there are a lot of questions that a lot of us have um, that are not going to be able to be answered in a public forum because they're subject to attorney client privilege um, and a lot of liability that comes along with that. So I would like all of us to be able to ask questions and have a candid legal discussion, which we cannot have um, unfortunately, just because of the nature of this situation. So I would, you know, I would love for all of us to be able to have that discussion before we make such an important decision. It feels a little bit like we're flying blind right now. And I frankly just don't feel like we're going to be able to get a lot more information. We're not going to be able to receive legal advice at all um, in public. And I just think that that would benefit our decision-making process to make to be able to do that. Thank you. Councillor Oliver. Yeah, thanks. Um, good answer, <laughs> but but I'm not going to vote for it. Um, I, I'd rather keep it in public. And as for, and I've heard this, the client attorney privilege many used many times, but city council is the client. And it's we're looking out for city council under these secret meetings. And as member of city council, I don't, I'm not worried about somebody suing us for telling them the truth. Um, and so uh, I'm a, I just don't love the idea of being secret. And so I'm going to have to vote against this too. Thank you. Councilor Jansen to the motion. I, I tend to agree. I am all for transparency. This is a public issue. It needs to be discussed in the public. So I will be voting no on executive session. Thank you. Councilor Springsteen. I guess I'm a little confused about why we're making this motion again when uh, we already decided not to go to it, into executive session on this issue. And the reasons given by the counselors uh, who voted against it was transparency and the right of the public to uh, be part of this process of decision making. Recently, the Denver Public Schools got in a lot of trouble over going into an executive session when it was not warranted. And an executive session is warranted in very specific circumstances where we're looking at very specific fiduciary issues, not where, where we're looking at making policy to supersede the will of the voters. And so what I would suggest is like DPS, if we go into executive session in order to make policy and the press sues us the way that they did DPS, we are in a lot bigger trouble than we are just going before the public right now. Um, you know, I still haven't heard from you, Councillor Stewart, or from our legal counsel, what, what it is that we're getting attorney client privileged information about. And what I would also say is that um, communications from our legal counsel have essentially been intimidating communications where if we don't go along with whatever that advice is that we are personally liable in some way because somehow they know everything there is to know about the law so i'm not convinced that this would even be useful to us um i think it's bad advice to to tell a city council that um you know, localities just go along with whatever state and federal law supersedes our law. I mean, I would take issue with that and that attitude because the thing is, we fought a civil war over that issue and states um, battle with the federal government on, on superseding state law all the time. So, Anyway, I, nobody can tell us why 
this is attorney client privileged information that we are talking about and why we won't get in trouble, just like the DPS board did very recently for going into executive session to make policy. So that's my issue. Councilor Franks. Thanks, Mayor Paul. Um, I wanted to uh, indicate that I would be supporting going into an executive session, but certainly wanted to share why. Um, I think it's sort of analogous to if I have a dispute with someone or don't agree with something, and then I'm asked to record my conversations with my uh my legal representative about when I'm exploring options, like if I chose this option, how does this particular piece of the legislation fit or what are our possible uh, remedies? And so for me, it's a matter of wanting to be able to explore and press upon some of the very relevant issues in a way in which I'm not sharing that information with folks who may later, depending on whatever action we take, may decide that uh, that is adverse to their interests and would want to uh, take us to court. So it's really me doing my due diligence. Of course, you know, we would come back into a regular session. Any votes would happen there, as Councillor Stewart said. But this is a matter of very lot, lot of complexity and wanting to be fully educated in making a decision that um, honors my fiduciary responsibility, honors what I know about what my constituents, uh, what their interests are. And so I will be supporting this. Uh, we do need a super majority. And so I just want the community to know that, that the good decision-making happens when you have all the relevant information. And I think there are legal questions that some of us have that would not be able to be explored um, in this public forum, but would definitely be impactful to uh, to how a, a vote would go once you have that information. So I will be in support of this, and I am certainly hopeful that we can get a supermajority uh, to move into executive session and do the people's work. Thank you. Great. Mayor Pro Tem Strom. Thank you. Uh, it, the bottom line is that there are a lot of decisions that that we're being asked to make tonight and well tonight and, and in the months to come. There are decisions that come with liability, liability that we, I believe, do not have enough information to really come up with the best decisions for our broader liquid community. There's so many things that are involved in this. And this, this is doing the executive session for this process. It's a very defined when it's allowed and what can and cannot be done. We're not allowed to go off agenda. Votes do not happen. Um, it's very specific and it's not one that's just liquid that's doing it. Golden, in fact, will be going through this process tomorrow night as well, but it is incumbent upon me, I believe, as a, uh, a fiduciary for the city that we're actually making these decisions with all of the information that is um, applicable to that. Um, and, you know, to the, that the point that was made earlier, like if you're having a legal dispute and there could potentially be legal disputes between many parties here, You've got to be able to consult with an attorney before you decide best how to move forward. And so I, too, would be in support of re, um, readdressing that possibility as we move forward. Thank you. Councilor Matt Guerrero. Thank you. I am also in favor of um, going into an executive session for several reasons that I think have already been expressed. But again, the... Um, the notion that we would actually make a choice in executive session, right? That's just not true. That's not the point of it. The point is that we can really find out like what are the possible legal consequences of various pathways without having that then be something that corners us into these types of like legal responsibilities and allowing us to have that honest consultation. And pardon me for I'm starting to lose my voice today for some reason. Um, 
But I also want to say, you know, the public transparency is so necessary for actually policymaking. But of course, one of the reasons that an executive session is necessary with something that is potentially legally tumultuous is because all sides of folks are a part of the public, right? It is not just people who are pro keeping the SGI exactly as it is. It is also developers, right? And so I think that there is sort of... um, you know, and I don't think that like my feeling on the cap, right? Like I don't, I don't like the SGI very much. I'm very honest about that. But my notion on why we need to have an executive session is not actually to advance that because that's just not a good way to make policy. Um, it's really specifically to think about how are we not making our community vulnerable? How are we like honoring both the like duties that we have fiscally, financially, and legally? in this space in a changing legal landscape. And we really saw the last time that we were discussing our potent, this potential ordinance of um, extending for the 24 months with the idea that we would then have to sunset it and have something else, which is what that law allegedly requires, right? We were trying to ask some really specific questions about what are those potential repercussions? What does that process look like? We weren't able to get the answers for this exact reason. And so I know that I don't actually have all of the information that I need to make like the smartest possible policy decision in this tricky moment. So I will definitely be in favor of this executive session. Councilor Vincent. Um, I won't belabor anything that everybody else has already said, but one additional uh, piece of information, when you go into an executive session, everybody hears the same information at the same time. They're also allowed to ask clarifying questions if something's not said, um, so that everybody has an equal opportunity to understand the same information at the same time, which when you have something such as this is, I think, extremely important um, whenever, and I don't think we use executive sessions willy-nilly, I'll say. Um, They're only when called, when important, and when we need information. So I will, of course. You you went on mute at the very end, but I think you were saying you're going to support. So thank you. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Councillor Abel. You're muted. There we go. Uh, I believe last uh, week we had a reading of the law that uh, governs executive sessions. And it refers to a specific legal question to be answered before we can go into executive sessions. That's relevant. That's also required. And having half a loaf is not enough when you're talking about taking something out of the public realm and putting it behind the, the cloak of executive session. So number one, what is the specific legal question? Counselor Rebecca. Counselor, you made the motion. But counselor, if you want to restate the the motion, because that again, just like last week, it's the same as this week. Oh yeah, we'll dock all the requirements because it's inconvenient. Thank you. Okay, counselor, don't worry about it. Uh, counselor Springsteen, go ahead. <clears throat> Again, there was a lot in the press about the DPS going into executive session. And one of the things that the press sued about was that state law allows elected officials to meet in executive session to discuss certain legally sensitive matters, including staff or student information that must be kept confidential, some contract negotiations, lawsuits, and other topics. But the topics and legal justification for the executive session must, must be described in a public agenda item that that is noticed to the public ahead of time. Making a motion here tonight is not noticing to the public 
the exact legal item that we are we would be discussing in executive session you have had plenty of time to come up with something like that this motion is inadequate um you know and i mean this was extremely embarrassing to dps it was months of litigation many many uh um in the press were involved in the litigation and specifically it was regarding the formation of public policy um which may not be conducted in secret and that is what we are contemplating here tonight we we are not we 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 are you are contemplating being advised which of the three items that we should choose from that is creation of public policy that is specific to um making policy and that is outside the sight of the public and what i would say to all of you who are in favor of this you are in favor of lack of transparency of covering up government wrongdoing of covering up so, um, so council let's be careful with the accusations please let's just stick to the facts about the motion that's on the table please thank you just like the mayor who always interrupts me whenever i'm saying something that is getting to the heart of the matter well i'm just trying to keep some decorum and this is a this is a uh a powerful subject but we don't want to attack the people we want to just talk about what's before us and that's the executive session not the intent by people wanting to um have this conversation okay what i want to attack is the lack of transparency of this local government right. who should be behind the will of the voters and should not be trying to hide things from the voters who voted for this particular policy Right. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Jansen. Thank you. Um, so I just want to say that the executive session was not properly noticed, and I don't think it's should be legal right at this moment. And also, you know, when we're in executive session, our hands are tied and we cannot talk about what happens in the executive session. So that's another thing. Um, the public needs to know what we're talking about. This is this is their they voted for this initiative this is a public they need to know thanks so i'm just going to say a couple things keep in mind we represent all the public those that voted for this and those that didn't vote for it right and we have a fiduciary responsibility yes and, but and yeah, my, no, no, counselor no, no, counselor I have the floor thank <laughs> you um and and i would just also say that uh, in my 16 years of service to this city we've never been questioned upon the legality of our executive sessions we we follow them to the letter of the law and it's my understanding that the body can enact a legal motion to go in an executive session which was clearly stated to address legal um consultation regarding house bill 1255 which takes effect tomorrow and in fact we have a a neighbor who's doing the same thing um and and going forth so i'd ask our Attorney, just to clarify, if this is a legal motion, if council has the ability and what that looks like, I don't know if you can comment on DPS, but we're not going in to make policy by any means. The DPS situation was much different than what this is. Ms. McKinney Brown? Yes. Um, as several council members have said at previous city council meetings, that uh, you may go into executive session in any city council meeting as long as you give verbal notice which is within the language of the motion that uh, council member Stewart utilized. So this is absolutely lawfully noticed. And this is a regular practice of all city councils to go into executive session. This is not comparable to the DPS issue. DPS did not go into executive session just to consult with their attorney. They went to executive session to discuss a whole lot of policy issues. That's different to go into executive session to talk to your attorney about uh, legal research, legal concerns, legal thoughts, 
that's a very different thing. Uh, that information, if made public, could bind the hands of the city council members. And therefore, that information is never made public so that the city council members have the freedom to make the best decisions they can find for the city. Thank you. And and I would just add, unfortunately, I, I hope that we can do this. I, I'm seeing that we probably won't be able to. And that's going to limit my ability on, on what I can proceed with tonight as far as what I can support uh, of basically three options forward without having a full understanding and and um, understanding of where and, and how this lies and our liabilities as a city. Again, knowing that we represent all of the residents of the city of Lakewood and have that responsibility. Mayor Pro Tem Strom. Thank you. I would like to just go on record again that this is not a vote that I am doing um, to set policy. When policy is being set, we would be going through our normal channels that are very public, that are very process driven, and they're very transparent. Transparent. Um, I am doing this looking at it from a fiduciary capacity. I want to be clear that I would like to consult with my attorney to answer questions that are coming to us like, are we going to sue the state? Can we sue the state? And other types of liability that might um, come to the city of Lakewood depending on the decisions that we make that move us past tomorrow. It's about liability. We would follow the normal process to put policy in place. Thank you. Councilor Abel? You're muted, sir. Uh, I'd like to correct a couple of pieces of uh, slightly misinformation that have been delivered in the last few minutes. Granted, Golan has this on their agenda tomorrow night, but according to Rick Merlby, Golan's Community Development Coordinator, there is no ordinance and there is no resolution to discuss. It's just a general topic. It's not even on voters radar screen yet. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And just to go back to the reason why is they're kind of where we were two weeks ago when we tried to do this and have that conversation. They were waiting to see what we did after a conversation I had with some of their elected. So they're not hearing it tomorrow. Thank you. Councillor Jansen. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you're for it or you're against it, the people voted for it and it passed. So you can't go behind the people and, and say, oh, well, we don't like it because the other people didn't like it. So we're going to vote against it. And that's not the way it's, it's a, it's, it's, this is not part of our democracy. They voted for this. It was part of the citizen initiative, they voted for it and they won. Um, I won by seven votes. Does that mean that, oh, I'm not really a counselor? I mean, come on, you know, and then you're, you want to do this. You want to um, go behind, behind and vote, try to vote it out. The people need to see what's going on. And that's why I am not for this executive session. Councilor Oliver. Thank you. Uh, I would point out one thing is that we have the city attorney sitting in front of us at all of our meetings, and we ask her questions at well, most of our meetings, and she answers, and so I still do have not wrapped my head around why there are certain questions that we have to have in secret, um, but, but perhaps you can help me, um, Ms. McKinney-Brown. Um, you were saying something about we might get bound up. Do you, can you come up with a hypothetical thing where we, yeah, I mean, yeah, some a hypothetical situation where we get in trouble if we go into executive session or we go, get in the trouble if we don't go into executive session. Um, I believe uh, Councillor uh, Strom mentioned something about suing the state. That might be hypothetical. Um, I, I imagine that is actually not. Um, well, it's tough for me to come up with even something hypothetical where we can't tell the citizens what's going on. 
So yeah, give it a shot. Yeah. I'm not good at coming up with hypotheticals. Uh, it's too easy to trip into to, uh, areas where you reveal information. So I think the issue is if I tell the city council, my research has shown that X is legal or X is not legal, anyone who votes against the, the legal advice is going, to, is going to have the concern that they have acted against advice of council and if that creates fiduciary harm to the city, then have they specifically caused fiduciary harm to the city? And that's not just this issue, it's any policy issue. If you ask me about uh, Robert's rules or those, those administrative matters, I respond to those during a regular city council meeting. When we're talking about developing policy, I don't make public statements because this isn't, a, this isn't for the city attorney to decide. This is for the city council to decide. If the city council is wanting to make this decision without knowing what the legal research is, that's the city council's decision. Um, if the city council wants to meet with the city attorney to know what the city attorney's office has researched on this, we're happy to advise you on that information as well. But at this point, we're seeing this as a policy decision that has some significant legal issues attached to it. So um, no, I don't have a hypothetical, but I hope that answers your question. I think that's the best I can do. Okay, I do have a little follow up there though, because you mentioned something that you, and this was in your email that was sent to us today, um, late in the afternoon. And uh, it was number four, I think, or something about that. Um, you were talking about if we don't follow your Sir, that was an attorney client privileged email if you are repeating information out of attorney client privileged email you violate charter and so i'm going to advise you please don't make public statements about information received in privileged communications okay this in that case this is hypothetical um two lawyers walk into a room <laughs> um and one says something is legal and another says something is illegal that that is certainly a possibility isn't it so if some it, lawyer says something is legal i already said it. i don't need to repeat it yes so what you would do is follow advice of your attorney there are oftentimes other attorneys who like to give you their legal opinions but they always have an agenda your attorney has one agenda and that's the best interest of you as their client other attorneys they're going to have other agendas so yes if two attorneys walk into a room someone's going to try to convince you of their opinion. Is their opinion in support of their client or is their opinion in support of the city? So my team and I work only for the benefit of the city. Right, okay, I, I understand that. I'm just trying to point out that the, the attorney for city X might have a completely different opinion than an attorney for city Y. And so everything is, is not, 100% black and white. But I don't think we need to go down this road anymore. So uh, I think you've answered my question. So thank you. Councilor Sherazai. Yes, I'd like to call the question. We've been debate this all night. I think we know the direction it's going in. Let's just vote and get to business. Second. It's okay. There's a motion to call a question. Please cast your votes. I, uh, what, what are we voting on right now? To call a question. Right. So only to vote on. We're calling the question. Yep. What's that mean? Please. It means that we'll, we will stop debate if it passes. Yeah, that's what I said. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Cause the people voting no think we're voting on something else right now. I would just point that out that this vote is only to stop debate and vote on the original. Yeah. Thank you. All right, that passes uh, 10 eyes, one nay, the nay being Councillor Springsteen. <laughs> okay, so will the clerk please read item four into the record? Public hearing on item four, ordinance O-2023-30, an emergency ordinance temporarily enacting and enforcing a non-renewable anti-growth law for the purpose of developing or amending land use plans or land use laws 
covering residential development or the residential component of a mixed use Mr. development. Clark, Mr. Clark, sorry. I think we still need to vote on the previous motion. Sorry, Mayor. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. And just Not for that. clarification, Mr. that's yep. the exact session okay. motion. Yep, that's the executive session. So forgive me. Okay, so we'll go back to the original vote of whether to go into an executive session or not. Please cast your votes. Okay, and that passes, but not with a super majority. The lack of super majorities, counselors Abel, Jansen, Olver, and Springsteen to deny the executive session opportunity. So I'll now ask the clerk to please read item four into the record. Thank you, Mayor. Public hearing on item four, ordinance O-2023-30, an emergency ordinance temporarily enacting and enforcing a non-renewable anti-growth law for the purpose of developing or amending land use plans or land use laws covering residential development or the residential component of a mixed use development. Or I open the public hearing. Uh, Councillor Jansen, your hand is up. Um, yes. Um... So um, I am all for transparency and I hereby move that the city council does not recognize HB 23-1255 as a valid law of the state and direct staff to continue to enforce LMC 14.27 uh, and to take all legal steps necessary to defend the LMC 14.27, the strategic growth in initiative. I'll second that, but I don't think we need that motion right now. Well, there's a motion and a second. And um, so unfortunately, by doing that, you've since cut off all the public comment towards this. So if you would like to go ahead and move forward, there's a motion and a second. Any discussion on this ordinance or on this one before us? Councilor Franks. I would just like to say that I had uh, many uh, legal questions that uh, would have uh, informed a uh, ability to uh, be well informed in advance of the vote. And I'm quite disappointed that we did not get a chance to ask very relevant legal questions that would have ensured that we were better positioned to uh, to cast our votes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Abel. Uh, I would just like to note that uh, we're in public session, we're doing it the proper way. Uh, I believe this has, this motion has some risk to it, uh, but every motion we, everything we approve has some risk to it. Uh, so, and there are always legal questions out there about everything. So after, while I listen to this discussion, I will make up my mind which way I'm going to vote on this. But there is a level of discomfort. Uh, there is also a level of knowing that by doing this, we put ourselves solidly behind the uh, clearly stated wishes of our voting public. Thank you. Councillor Olver. Yes, as I was saying, I think we might have jumped the gun there on that motion, but I still wanted to second it. Um, could could somebody give us whoever? Well, Adam, Mayor, um, perhaps you could give us a um, how you thought this meeting was going to go, because I've looked at uh, our city attorney's. Um, email today and she had three options and was saying that we are voting on three options tonight and i believe that councillor jansen was afraid that we were going to jump straight into number three and she likes number one as do i um but could you just give us some background on how you intended this discussion to go ahead and maybe we can get it back on track and also for those who worry about asking questions i mean and and the city attorney not being able to respond ask them and perhaps they 
are not in the realm of something she cannot respond about. Right. So yeah. just to, to answer, yeah, procedurally, just like any other opportunity that we read in a, a second reading ordinance, or in this case, it's a, yeah, it's a second reading. Um, we open the public hearing, we have public comment, and then we have uh, a motion read in, and then that can either be amended, voted up or down, discussed, changed. So the the actions tonight were just the same as we always do and have done. And um, so that's well, kind of but not right. necessarily because it looked like from that email today that we were we had three options that we were going to talk about and vote on one of them and pick one of them. Um, and we we're afraid that that one has already been picked. One of them has already been picked. And um, so, I mean, how are we going to go through talking about three options? There is an ordinance that you're presenting for sure. Um, but there's only one one option inside of that. So which option was that? And how do we change that? I mean, how are we proceeding here? It's, so it's, yeah, the option before us was the one that was set for public hearing tonight on first reading. And there's also two others. And again, this goes back to the lack of our ability to have conversation with our legal counsel as to the three different options. And so we are limited to that but we're following the protocol that set up on the first reading for us tonight to look at 02030-30 on second reading, which would allow for the public comment first off on that and also on any of the three options, because I know those are out into the community, as well as uh, the opportunity to amend, to vote up and down on all three and to see what passed. So that's what was before us tonight. Okay, but not. Uh, so three options in one ordinance, that just doesn't strike me as, you're saying that like what we were going to do was to bring up the ordinance and inside that ordinance, it says we were going with number three. And if we wanted to go, council wanted to go with something else, we would have to defeat that ordinance vote and then make a different vote for a different option. Yes. That's correct. what you're saying? Correct. So either the okay. I think the three options were to either uh, comply with the state or not to comply with the state or to take the third option, which is the off ramp. Right. Yep. Okay. So okay. how are we going to proceed now that we have a motion and a and a second? Well, we're debating what's on the floor right now. So I have um, Councillor Sherazai Maya Guerrero, Councillor yeah. Springsteen, and the motion makers' hands up. So there we go. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Sherazai. Yeah, I would like to call the question on this as well, since we have limited things to discuss regarding this, and we were really here to discuss the the second reading of the ordinance. Was my understanding. So I'd love to end debate and call the question for the vote. It, I can so second. there's a there's a call to call the question on Councillor Jansen's motion to um, I think it was let me go back and look at what that was her motion was to direct staff through regular motion to well, let's see here Perfect. regular motion to immediately stop no, to enforce lmc 1427 and to fail to recognize house bill 1255 as a valid law on the state so there is a motion to call the question in a second so this is strictly on calling the question to the vote on the motion so please cast your votes on calling the question i'm sorry don't we get the talk about calling the question no i don't it's not debatable so it looks like calling the question passes um I, how is how is that not debatable whether to call the question we have not discussed that's this the issue yep. why are you the city attorney mayor can we talk to the city attorney? Sure. She says she represents the yeah, city. Certainly, we can Why ask her about her? calling the calling the question. There was a motion and a second to call the question. 
I'll give her a second. And, and my question was, don't we have debate on this calling the question? That's fair. Thank you. I apologize. I'm struggling to get my computer to turn on and off this evening. So it is taking me an extra couple of seconds. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with Robert's rules of order, there are certain privilege motions that do not allow debate. Calling the question is one of those. So once it's been, uh, once the motion is made and seconded, there is no debate. The, the vote is just taken and that's pursuant to Robert's rules of order. Right. Thank you. So again, we have a motion and a second to uh, call the question. Please cast your votes. Okay, and that passes uh, eight ayes, three nays, the nays being Olver, Jansen, and Springsteen. So that'll take us to the original motion that Councillor Jansen made, which was to direct staff through the motion to continue to enforce LMC 1427 and to fail to recognize H. Bill 23, 1255 as a valid law of the state. Please cast your votes. Uh, we finished. I'm seeing a lot of hands up. Have we finished discussion on that one? Yeah, counselor. So Call once, the yeah, once, once the question was called. Right. I got yeah. it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Thanks. Okay. And so that motion fails. Um, please keep these up. A motion fails. <laughs> set eight. No, seven, four, the nays being Maya Guerrero, Paul, Stewart, Vincent, Franks, Sherazai, Strom. Okay. I'm going to now open the public hearing on ordinance 2023-30. And just mention to those who are tuning in that the two options before us now are either the actual 2023-30 or um, the third option, which is to not enforce 14.27. So the rules, uh, this is the point in the meeting where the public is invited to address the city council. I ask that all persons calling in observe the decorum of city council meetings. Um, you'll have an opportunity if you'd like to raise your hand at this point, you can go ahead and press um, nine, star nine, to go ahead and get in the queue. We will call you over. There'll be a three minute time limit. And when your time is at 30 seconds, we'll go ahead and give you a, and when your time is up, I'll ring it twice and uh, politely ask you to wrap that up. In order for our clerk to keep record, please again, give us your name an address or name in ward, and uh, we'll go ahead and get going. So if you'd like to get in the queue, again, please go ahead and press star nine. And I have Miss Kentner and she has requested to pool. So let me just make sure I know, think that your people are here, but let's just make sure so we can click these off. So we'll do 10 minutes for Ms. Kentner, um, and she's pooling her time with Ms. Herskovitz, Mr. Kenny, Ms. and Mr. Barthel, and Ms. Brewer. So I do see Mr. Kenny. I see Ms. Herskovitz. I think that's Liz. So there's three. So we'll go ahead and bring you over, and I'll let you know when your time's going. And I will note that there were 13 comments on Lakewood Speaks. And if you are calling in and you did write a comment, please try to refrain from redundancy. All right, Ms. Kentner. Thank you, Council. Yep, give me, hold on real oh, quick. Let me, your, let me get your time going. Okay, go ahead. So now I should start? Yep, go ahead. Okay, good evening, Council. Um, luckily, I do not plan to take all 10 minutes as I would like to clarify that I will be addressing the one and only ordinance that is on Lakewood Speaks where the public is um, is directed to check the agendas. Evidently, there seem to be a couple of different classes of citizens, those who are available to some other information and the majority who are have what was online on um, Lakewood Speaks. 
So on the public agenda tonight is second reading for an emergency ordinance that would effectively put a two year sunset on the voter approved Lakewood strategic growth initiative. In 2017, nearly 10,000 signatures were collected from people wanting strategic growth for Lakewood. And in 2019, the voters approved the Lakewood Strategic Growth Initiative, a permit allocation system giving the city a mechanism to do what everyone agrees on, prioritize the housing we need to be built first, affordable housing with ownership opportunities. But instead of listening, there was a concerted effort to silence the voice of the people. First, city resources and staff time were used to draft talking points against signing the petition. When that didn't stop us from gathering signatures, a court action was tried. And when that failed, big money developer interest groups poured over a half million dollars to beat us at the ballot box. And when that failed, the people breathed a sigh of relief. We won, they cried, and trusted their elected officials to finally be responsive to the demand for Lakewood strategic growth. But behind the scenes, city staff continued handing out building permits without hearings. Behind the scenes, while the people who supported the initiative were busy working one, two, even three jobs to support our families, trusting that our elected officials would respect our vote, those same special interest groups were hard at work at the state level to try to reverse the constitutionally valid vote of the people. The result was HB 1255 a bill which amounts to nothing more than legalized name calling and suggests that the state can usurp our local land use control. Now, tonight, this body is considering a second reading on an ordinance that misleads and fosters divisiveness by calling supporters of the Lakewood Strategic Growth Initiative anti-growth. Now, tonight, this body is considering, not considering, I can't believe you're even considering acknowledging that the state can override a vote of the Lakewood people. The purpose and intent of the Lakewood Strategic Growth Initiative was not to cap growth, and it obviously never has kept growth below 1%. What this does tonight is to sunset the only mechanism you have for prioritizing the housing we need, for putting affordable units first, a requirement to get money from Initiative 123 for affordable housing. Oh yeah, where's the discussion on that? Back to tonight. How does this ordinance tonight further a public policy for the public good? It does not. This ordinance tonight does not provide for one affordable unit or house even one person who is unhoused. It does nothing to address affordability or inclusivity. Does this ordinance provide for the hearings that Representative Linstead says every project deserves? No, this ordinance would take away the few public hearings we have. This ordinance does encourage displacement of families and encourages urban sprawl by continuing the practice of demolishing the single family homes most in demand and replacing them with unaffordable rental units, all in the veiled name of affordability. Don't be so short sighted to think that you may never be part of the minority. Don't be so short-sighted to think that someday you may not be the one without money and power. We live in a democracy, a representational system. And when our legislators don't represent, the people have a constitutional right to petition. Please don't take that right away tonight. Don't endorse a false assumption that a larger government can bully a smaller one. How does a position that a vote of the people can be overturned further our goals as a city? It does not. By doing this, you are stating that you agree that Lakewood has an anti-growth law. We do not.
That is insulting to your constituents who are not anti-growth and through a citywide vote demanded strategic growth. And if you think those same demands don't exist, you would be mistaken. Just this last Saturday, the Ward 1 meeting was dominated by conversations centered around a development and concerns over the density, lack of open space and infrastructure. And the fact that there is absolutely no requirement that a developer has to work with a neighborhood. Say no to this ordinance tonight and put in place what people have been demanding and agree on, inclusionary zoning and public hearings, real affordable housing, and a true say in the way our community develops. Lastly, this ordinance tonight, this meeting, Overturning a vote of the people is being done in a meeting virtual only. That's like a breakup through text, not even the courtesy to look your constituents in the eye. Great, thank you. All right, so Mr. Holman? This. We have your name, but address or ward, we'll get you going. Let me reset the timer too, please. Sure. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Just let me get to this little timer here. Perfect. All right. Go ahead. Are you, name, are we, uh, ward or address? Yeah, I'm in ward two. Uh, okay. My name is Brian Holman. Uh, I'm 30 years old. I've been a Lakewood resident in Two Creeks for six years. Uh, I'd like to posit against the emergency growth ordinance uh, first. Uh, it'll soon be illegal according to state law. Um, if we want to enter into, into any form of conflict with the state, I think we should hold another vote amongst the residents of Lakewood. Uh, do they want to use the city budget to potentially enter a legal battle? Um, we didn't know about this three or four years ago, so I think holding another vote might be worth it. Uh, second, I understand the reasoning behind adopting the growth limitation and understand that there are issues associated with rapid growth. However, the issues attempting to be addressed by the growth ordinance are not being addressed directly by it and unintended consequences of it have and will make many issues worse. If we want more green space, let's legislate something for public green space. If we want less traffic, let's write legislation for funding alternatives. If we want affordable housing, we need to bolster housing supply by improving zoning, working with developers and providing more housing options to residents, not just single family homes, not just apartments, but townhomes and duplexes, et cetera. Uh, if we want better infrastructure, let's build more efficiently. Uh, according to expert economists, urban planners, transportation planners, growth ordinance, ordinances like this have a negative impact on all of those issues. Fewer tax paying residents results in less tax revenue for our city services and infrastructure. Fewer homes close to job centers leads to additional sprawl, which reduces green space, encourages more driving, which leads to traffic and decreased air quality and personal health. Uh, it also increases infrastructure spend since more piping, wiring, roads, et cetera, are needed to serve the sprawled out residents. Uh, it also reduces housing availability which increases homelessness and leads to all sorts of other problems related to homelessness. Uh, if we want to address the problems that are caused by increased growth, we have to address those problems individually using the data and knowledge from experts. We can't solve these issues caused by growth by simply limiting it within our own city borders. Young families will simply move elsewhere, such as Arvada, which was recently ranked one of best, the best places to live for new families for reasons that Lakewood is falling behind on. Please, City Council, be thoughtful about Lakewood's future and the future of our residents and families and oppose this growth limitation. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Yep, thank you. And again, just to remind the public, if you'd like to speak, go ahead and press star nine and then you'll press star six to undo that. The first ding is 30 seconds and the second one is time's up. Mr. Thormasgard, go ahead and bring you over. If you give us your uh, address or ward, I'll start your three minutes. All right, yeah, my name is David Thormansgard. I'm with Ward 3, and uh, I kind of agree with Brian. Um, to, to say that 
like the people voted for this initiative how can the state supersede it like you also voted for the state government as well and so they're representing you too and if the state sees communities doing something that it thinks is wrong i don't see why they shouldn't be able to regulate that um and i think that our codes could be better and that's why we should vote to go ahead and um give ourselves the time to think about how to adopt that if we just go in and say oh we're just going to develop a new um alternative to 1427 right now like that's that's not going to give us a good solution to the problem and uh i think we do open ourselves up to some liability if we don't make a decision and the whole thing goes in um into order tomorrow and so i would say we should vote for the extension because it gives us the time to think about how we're going to address these problems um, without opening us up to that that um liability for not complying so uh thank you for uh your time and i hope you guys can make a good decision right thank you very much all right anybody else in attendance wish to speak on this please raise your hand and that's going to be star nine going once going twice all right i think i saw a hand go up maybe not I see one that goes up and goes down. All right, we'll go ahead and close public comment on ordinance 2023-30. And I'll ask for a motion to be read into the record and then we can discuss debate. I move for the adoption of emergency ordinance 0-2023-30 on second and final reading. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second on this emergency ordinance. Is there any discussion? All right, Councillor Mayak Guerrero. Yes, I wanted just one point of clarification. I hope we can get from the attorney's office, which is, so if we don't pass this emergency ordinance, then when the state law becomes the law, like is enacted, is effective, are 1427 just fully goes away or is that am I misunderstanding like what ends up happening if we don't pass this uh, first is Lauren Stanick available she is the senior uh, um, assistant city attorney for land use and she's worked with me very closely on the research of this issue and I wanted to make sure she is yep she's there. in the meeting okay. now welcome okay. Ms. Stanick Hello, thank you everyone. Sorry, I had to join as a panelist. Um, so thank you for your question, Councilor Matt Guerrero. So what you have in front of you, this first, um, or this motion that was just made, if you decide if, if there is not majority vote cast, obviously then members of council can propose other motions. Um, I know that that was done at the beginning of this public hearing, but the next option would be that if if a council member chooses, they could move to specifically recognize House Bill 23-1255 as valid law taking effect tomorrow. There could be other motions made from councilors. So based on well, however you vote on this motion, there are still many other options that um, that you can pursue. But sort of just be working through the options that you have done so far. To clarify, uh, Councilmember Matt Guerrero, 
the, the question that I understood you're asking was whether or what were the consequences of the outcomes of this vote? And consequence one is if it passes by a supermajority, it passes as an emergency ordinance, which means there's no 30 day um, wait period. It would go into effect immediately and it would be in effect tomorrow, the same day that the state law goes into effect. It can be passed by a majority, but not a supermajority. Then it goes into effect as a regular ordinance, meaning it would become law in 30 days. Because a majority of the city council will have made it clear to staff that they intend to follow 1255 by passing this ordinance um, in the 30 days pending between the vote and it going into effect, staff would be very careful not to enforce any sections of 1427, which would be in violation of state law or it can fail. So one of three outcomes from the vote on this particular ordinance. And as uh, Lauren has stated, if this ordinance should fail, city council has a variety of other options it can pursue. Spanker, do you have any follow-up? Was that? No, I think that that was my main question. I, I guess I asked that question too, because we really are hearing both in the comments online, some of the emails, discussions I've had with constituents, and I think even among folks here, um, just the lack of, right, there are folks who are pro continuing with some level of like smart growth and wanting actually more control. And so this is seen as a way to move forward with that, where we pass this ordinance and then we buy ourselves some time to actually figure out good alternatives that are still legal under this new state law, but that still give us and the people of Colorado adequate tools to actually like influence the development in Lakewood. And I would actually argue that while I am somebody who is not generally in favor of the SGI, I am very in favor of increased uh, oversight process and transparency around our development. And I'm very in favor of increased programs to um, adequately like, fund and support and create affordable and like mid-range housing. I'm also very in favor of sustainability measures that would require more green space per unit per person than we currently have. And the for me, the SGI actually is not adequate on those things. And the original language said very little about affordable housing and was certainly at least not um, legally you know, written. Now it's always talked about affordable housing, but we actually had to fix it last summer in order for it to be possible for affordable housing developers to qualify for the necessary funding and subsidies that they needed to develop affordable housing in Lakewood since the passage of the SGI. So I just feel like there's that mixed message there where then you hear somebody speak about, we shouldn't pass this, we should just let the state law do its thing and hopefully we'll come up with something better by the time you know we get sued on it. Or we hear the other side of it, whereas if we pass this and that means we're turning our back on this idea of smart growth at all. And I think that's kind of why I was asking that question is just try to tease that out. I think that for me, I'm not actually in favor of this ordinance because I do think that we need to create something better and more. And I think that we will end up honestly being like in a space where we're vulnerable to lawsuits because of not passing this, but we weren't able to get all of our legal advice that we needed and we weren't able to chew on it and think about it in the way that we needed to actually come up with all these legal options. And I think that's really unfortunate. Um, versus I also know that there are people who don't want us to pass this because they think that that's how we continue the SGI. So I just wanted to, I'm trying to like tease out exactly kind of those consequences, you know, without putting us in a legally difficult conversation. Um, so thank you so much. And again, apologies for my voice. No worries. Uh, Councillor Stewart. Thanks. Yeah, I think I'm struggling with um, some similar, um, some similar issues. Um, I know that there is concern um, 
that this would be potentially a continuation without us really taking responsibility for um, addressing some of the actual, the very real needs of our community around housing affordability and housing supply. And also making sure that we are holding folks accountable to design and aesthetics um, and green space and sustainability. Um, and so I, I know this is going to throw a wrench in public comment for a hot minute, so I apologize to the folks with their hands up, but I'm gonna make a motion to amend this ordinance. Um, so I'd like to uh, make a motion uh, to change where uh, is mentioned 24 months, up to 24 months to up to 12 months in the declaration and in section one and any subsequent sections that I've missed. Um, I believe those are the only two that I see um, just to, to be able to hold us accountable to all of our voters to really um, put something in place that really meets the needs of our community. Um, I don't love the idea of, I think 24 months is just kicking all of the cans down the road, regardless of how one feels about this ordinance. So um, my motion is to amend um, ordinance 0-2023-30 in the declaration section and section one uh, to change 24 up to 24 months to up to 12 months. Is there a second? Second. Okay, that's Councilor Matt Guerrero. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Um, does anybody wish to speak to that motion? Councilor Franks. Thanks, Mayor Paul. Um, first, I would like to say, I, I certainly appreciate what Councilor Stewart is, is uh, attempting to achieve there, um, but I'm four months away from being off of council. There will be a new counselor. These jobs have a very steep learning curve. We also have a, uh, you know, a community that is um, evolving and changing every day. I see it when I look out my window and see kids on bikes that I haven't seen before. So we do know neighborhoods are changing and, um, um, and I, I may be asking a legal question that can't be answered, um, but I'm going to ask it anyways. And if it can't be answered, please. But my understanding is that the um, this two year period or this kind of is a one time option. And what I'm trying to understand is if we were to lower that to 12 months, does that prohibit us? from ever capturing back the additional 12 months that we would have had had we not shortened the time frame. So, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So in this particular case, the um, House Bill 1255 basically said uh, up to 24 months, and it was meant to be uh, so you could in change land use plans or laws incrementally. If the council decides tonight to reduce the tw reduce that time frame to 12 months to pass, you know, land, new land use plans or laws during that time, um, you would, I believe, we would be able to come back close to that 12 month mark. But the council would have to vote to actually extend um, and use those remaining 12 months that the bill allows for. So. But that would have necessitate obviously another public hearing and another vote down the line if for some reason city staff or council was not ready to take action within 12 months. Thank you. I appreciate that extra detail. Unfortunately, I, I won't be able to support this. I think that these matters are complicated enough. Um, I know that uh, whoever takes uh, over in for representing Ward 4, I know they will work hard, but that just is not enough time for a very complicated issue that I think needs to have a lot of uh, public input. Um, and so I, I would not be in support of the shortened time frame, but, but I appreciate and understand why it was offered. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Olver? Yeah, I'd echo Council Member Frank's statement just there. It's if it wasn't, if there wasn't an election, if we weren't changing half the council in a few months, yeah, you you might think about 12 months, but but I 
know how I know now how slowly city government moves and with the new people coming in and we're going to dump this on their laps uh and no it's just not, not enough time I'm sorry I have to vote no too thank you All right Councillor Abel Thank you, Mayor. A couple of things, well, more than a couple of things. A lot of procedural irritation here. Uh, firstly, voters, I hope, in this city have a long memory and realize what we have done with their uh, constitutionally protected direct democracy access. Secondly, we seem to have a new move toward making 11th hour amendments that are quite impactive on the legislation in front of us. After our public has had them, uh, has had the information in front of them for days, if not weeks. Uh, people don't like government by surprise, and I certainly don't. The uh, but my main concern is that once we do this, we have abandoned the targets of F SGI. And I would like to remind someone who just mentioned how unlikely it was to relieve um, the high cost of housing. Every year that SGI was in effect, 40% of the allocations were set aside for affordable housing and not one allocation got used for that purpose. Why do you think that is? It's because developers know dang good and well, they don't have to do that. They're gonna get what they want anyway. Thank you. Mr. Springsteen. What I always find so fascinating about these situations is that certain members of these of this council are allowed to make motions and to make them at the 11th hour and allowed to make amendments at the 11th hour and certain members are not. The mayor never allows me to do this, which is discriminatory, I will point out. And so only certain members of this council are allowed to speak. And the fact that we just had this, this circus of what happened with the first motion tonight demonstrates that. And what it demonstrates is that the people of these, this city are not allowed to speak. Um, all this motion does is to sunset what the voters voted on 12 months earlier. So it's an even quicker dismissal of our local democracy. And, you know, just looking through some of the times that um, local democracy has pushed back against the state. I mean, all I have to do is a quick Google on it. HB 221024, five cities, home rule municipalities, um, sued the state and Governor Polis in 2022 regarding exemption of construction and building materials used in public school construction from sales and use taxes. Those municipalities pushed back against the state. And we are being advised by our council tonight that whatever the state says goes. That is not legal counsel. I, I would like to ask our legal counsel, when you say you represent the city, what does that mean to you? Please tell us who you are representing because this legal counsel is not getting me where I need to be. Please tell me. Ms. McKinney-Brown. Yes, 
I've given this council no legal advice whatsoever concerning whether or not I believe this is a legal law or an illegal law. The city council has not heard that. Um, I'm not exactly sure what council member Springsteen is referring to, but those words have never come from myself or a member of my staff. Councilor Jansen. Well, I, what I wanted to do before you guys ask the question on me, I wanted to temporarily move my motion um, so we didn't get to discuss why option one would have worked. Um, and that's all I have. Thanks. Councilor Sherazai. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I just wanted to note for the public that second reading is the appropriate time to make an amendment. I've often been accused of blowing up things at the last minute, and I think it's really unfair and breeds mistrust in the community. There's, tell me the the additional place that we would be offering this up. You know, some of us are following procedures. We're entering into these conversations. We've met with our constituents. We're doing our homework, and we're coming prepared to have those conversations and discussions. And we get hammered publicly for that. And I just find that really frustrating week over week for us to be able to have this sort of dialogue. We need to be able to make amendments. And the second reading is the place for which to do that. But we all. Uh, Councillor Springsteen, you don't have the floor. No. Councillor, you don't have the floor. Uh, Councillor Stewart, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I just want to clarify a couple of different things. Um, one, that we have absolutely no idea um, about the legality of the state overturning the will of the people, because again, we were not allowed to go into executive session and ask those questions. So, I, I'm just happy to go ahead and ask that question now and see if we can get an answer. Um, is the state allowed to overturn the will of the people in this particular case? And is that legal? Thank you for your question. So council member Stewart, um, unfortunately, I can't go into too much detail and tell you about, again, the legality of this law or what we what the city can do in response to it without basically going into privileged information. So um, unfortunately, I can't really give you an answer to your question. And I'm just going to leave it at that. Apologies. Thank you. Um, that's helpful clarification. Just want the public to be able to see that we're not able to get certain answers because we were not able to go into executive session. Um, the concerns about overturning the will of the people is why I voted um, and led the legislative committee to strongly oppose this legislation because I had concerns about that, but we're past that now. Um, there were the votes to pass that. And so now we are here today and we're dealing with the reality of a new law that calls that question, but we can't make a decision based on the legality of that because we have no idea and can't get any advice. Um, so I, you know, again, that's, that's all I've got right now. So, so just a quick check in. I, I really want to ensure that we're being respectful in our thoughts and our words and our actions to our peers, as well as to our staff. So I'd really encourage I know this is a, a challenging subject, but um, I'd really encourage council to, to continue to do that, especially as we engage with staff. Councilor Franks. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I wanted to maybe ask the question in a slightly different way. Um, basically what we're trying to do is make sure that the public, uh, you know, is, is well informed about the challenges that we're facing tonight. So um, I'm going to present a hy quick hypothetical and see if that question can be answered in a way that might at least illuminate that. So if I were to um, have an issue and want to, uh, take something to the vote of the people. I go through all of the avenues to do that. It goes to a vote of the people and let's just call it object A, object A passes. And then my, the, the, the question I would have then is, so it passes, 
a year or two from now, is the council able to modify or nullify that action that, that would have been taken uh, by the voters? I guess I'm just trying to get to, um, it, you know, showing the fact that, uh, you know, laws um, are very complicated, but they're also able to be modified. And so I don't know if our legal staff would be able to answer that. But what I'm trying to do is just share sort of maybe some illumination on that topic. And thank you. And, and Councillor Franks, I think what your what your hypothetical goes to and what um, Councillor Stewart's question goes to really concerns the doctrine of preemption. And I know that there was perhaps some information given to Council about that. But what's difficult and why why we can't go into too much detail is that there are situations where um, legally where there are matters of, of local interest, state interest and mixed interest. And so in the hypothetical you posed where you just say, you know, object A or object B or whatever, whatever it may be, it's hard to really provide a thorough legal opinion or legal answer because what we would need to really examine is, is this a matter of state and local interest? And then from there, there's a, you know, a test as to whether or not, you know, the state can, can preempt laws or is this a matter of local interest or, or purely statewide interest? So unfortunately, Without being able to go into specifics, I really can't provide a more detailed answer about yeah. what can supersede what. And thank you so much for that. That's what I'm trying to illustrate. That's why I so desperately wanted to go into executive session. I had all these types of questions which would have been able to be fully uh, fleshed out with all of our counselors and brought back to bear. So I was just trying another way to say, we are trying to be as educated as we as we can, but there are questions that I would have liked to uh, have gotten uh, legal input for and would have liked to had a conversation with all my fellow counselors on that in order to come back with the best decision. But I, I realize, and I thought you would not be able to, given the hypothetical, had no specifics about those very issues. But thank you. Appreciate it. Councilor Oliver. Okay, Lauren, I'm going to pile on um, and do the exact same thing the last two counselors talked about. I, I don't think you're being real um, honest uh, about your answer. They are asking you about general wild hypothetical questions and you're going into specifics about our spe our specific uh ordinance and i mean i think counselor stewart asked you if the state could overwrite um a local law and, and that to me is a very simple question it's yes or no um not not something all about, well, we have to talk about Lakewood and I can't get it. I have to be in specifics. You know, it's like, yes, I'm sure they can. Um, it's like uh, the feds have told the states and the, the municipalities uh, that, um, you know, gun ownership, abortion. I mean, you name any topic and the, the feds tell us what we can do. Um, and the state tells us what we can do on certain things. They just tried to pass 213 that was going to tell us all um, what we could do. And so I believe the answer is yes. And I don't believe you're being forthcoming enough. And, and you're switching their question from a very general question to something very specific, which you might not be able to answer. But they're, both of their questions were very general. So. Well, and I think council member over, I think what's what's difficult or what I'm trying to wrap my head around is we're we're talking about hypotheticals, but when I'm given, you know, object A, object B, or or trying to speak specifically to this ordinance tonight, I can't provide an informed legal opinion. I know we're that trying, we're not trying to ask you about this ordinance tonight. We're trying to ask you simply this question: can the state override a municipal election? Uh, a municipal municipal um where the people all vote that's that's very very simple let's leave anything about what we're talking about here in this ordinance tonight out of it can the state pass a law that overrides local control and i'd have to say the answer is yes are you going to say the answer is no all i'm to all i'm trying to to get across uh council member is that there, there are examples like you've mentioned, let's say oil and gas, water law, 
things where the state has decided this is a matter of statewide concern, we're going to supersede all local ordinances or local rules. Then there are matters like zoning, where case law has stated and courts have supported that that is something that's of local concern. And that's why you see a lot of municipalities with their own zoning codes. I can't give a, a, a more specific you description. Did, you answered the question right there. There is oil and gas things where the state oversees, um, supersedes local control. That's that's the answer. Um, so you don't need to go down. Sorry to interrupt you there, but yeah, you don't need to go into this because we're not, they didn't ask you about this. Thank you very much. And so we have two more hands up and I'll continue to go just, just to check. I let, I let everybody talk on things outside of what the motion is, but we'll finish up and get back to the motion, please. Councillor Springsteen. Well, I, you know, again, this, this little game of cat and mouse where we're asking direct hypothetical questions and we're not getting legal counsel because we're going to throw a tantrum because we didn't get to go into executive session is not right. The public has a right to hear these issues. The example I gave you was something that CML and Kevin uh, Bomber, who had CML, spoke to this challenge to an unconstitutional piece of legislation adopted by the General Assembly and signed by the governor is a great test of home rule authority. He was speaking to that House bill I told you about, 2210-24. Kevin Bomber and CML have said the same thing about this. And our own council will not at least speak to other situations where local authority was superseded and they challenged that at the state level um this is this is not right this is um ramrodding the way that certain members of this staff want this to go that's not okay you and i'm gonna ask the question again council who do you think you represent specifically the people of this city, this council who represent the people of this city, the staff, the mayor, who specifically, the city manager, who specifically do you see as your client in this matter? Because that will help you to answer the questions that we're asking you. I'm sorry, Abel. No, I asked a question Thank of you. the city attorneys and I'd like an answer as to who their client is. Counselor, you've been on this body for four years and you're an attorney yourself. I think this has been explained. Yes, it if has. Counsel, if council and wants to ask that, they can, but I'm not going to have you badger them. I'd like to ask that. Abuse them. And so I, if council wants to ask answer that, they can. If not, I'm going to go to Counselor Abel. I can answer that, uh, Mr. Mayor. So, Councillor Springsteen, we obviously look to our guiding document, the charter, and under Section 4.6b, it specifically delineates um, who our client is, and it says the city attorney shall be the chief legal counsel of the city and the legal advisor to, and that includes city council, city manager, all departments of the city and boards and commissions. Um, and then obviously the city manager being Ms. McKinney Brown, she, um, then can appoint, promote, suspend, transfer, remove employees in the office of the city attorney. So she can, she decides who we serve, but it's per charter. I, I can't hear you. You said the city manager, and I think you meant the city attorney, but I think you answered my question by saying that because that's who you really represent isn't it? The city manager, not the city council. We represent four, four entities per charter. Thank you, Ms. Stanek. Ms. Uh, Councilor Abel. Thank you. I just want to correct one thing. I believe relying on the information Ms. Stanek gave us earlier, we're not looking at a second reading. 
we're looking at an emergency ordinance. And depending on whether it passes with a supermajority or not, if it just simply passes with a majority, then second reading would be next week. Just but, wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Council Abel, no, I'm sorry. That's incorrect. We actually had a first reading on this. And when? so this is the bona fide second reading. There's not there's not a third reading. When was the first reading on this? Uh that Did was Ms. Danny say. Uh, Councillor, that was at our last say, at our last regular it, meeting, sir. Did Ms. Danick say our last regular meeting? Yes, sir. I believe Ms. Danick said that if we pass this by supermajority tonight. Then that's one thing, but if it passes by just a simple majority, it becomes second reading next week. Is that what you said, Ms. Stanick? Or did well, I mishear you? It, no, Councilmember Abel. So if it passes by a supermajority, it becomes effective immediately. If it passes by a simple majority, then it would go into effect 30 days from tonight. So there would, wouldn't be another reading? No, there, this is second reading. There wouldn't okay, be. Okay, thank you. Just to clarify, I mean, Councillor Abel, we had we down. had first reading on uh, July twenty fourth. I'm hearing the stream is down. Okay, we'll go ahead and let Mr. Goldstein know. Thank you, Councillor Jansen. Yes, I, I have a question. So we're still on the amendment motion, correct? Correct. Will we still have some time for? Um, speaking on the main motion? Yes, ma'am. So the, the way this works is it's read into the record as, mm -hmm. as the public hearing is opened. It's read into the record. There's public comment. The motion is made to bring it in for discussion. Once discussion happens, then amendments are taken. There's mm -hmm. the amendments voted up or down, and then we move on to the next phase of discussion. Okay, thanks. Okay. So going back to the original motion, that Councillor Stewart made would take this from uh, up to 24 months to up to 12 months. Is everybody clear on that? Okay, there's a motion the second was Councillor Macarero, please cast your votes. Okay, and that motion fails. And it, it, let's see here, it's two, three, four. Riley, you're upside down. So eight to seven, seven, sorry, four to seven, the nays being Jansen, Olver, Springsteen, Abel, Franks, Vincent, and Strom. Got to make sure I got that right. All right, now we can continue conversation on the body of the ordinance. Councillor Olver. Okay, I still have a problem with the wording of it, as I did at our last meeting when we talked about this. So I'm going to make uh, make a motion. Uh, I simple. It's real simple. I move to change the words anti-growth to strategic growth. Everywhere, an ordinance O dash. 2023-30. Second. That's that's all. I just don't believe it's um it's not anti-growth. It has never been anti-growth. Um, if it was anti-growth, there wouldn't be anything being built, and we have things being built all the time. Um SGI is was stands for strategic growth. Um when I voted for it when it first came out. Uh, I looked at it and I said, well, yeah, a little bit of a, um, you know, we don't want to stop growth completely, but and you don't also, you also don't want to let it run away like a runaway train. Uh, and so strategically limit, limiting it seemed like a good idea at the time. And so I don't like the idea of the being called an anti-growth law. Uh, and so, therefore, that is why I made the motion. And um, perhaps our lawyer wants to address that because I brought this up previously, and she was saying that it uh, it has to be this way. But I'm still going to stick to my guns that I don't believe it has to be this way. 
And so if, if you want to, um, the city attorney wants to say it has to be this way, uh, could you tell us why and what would happen if we change it anyway? I mean, could uh, would the police come and check and, and grab me and drag, drag me out? Or would the state sue us? Or, you know. So, neither, neither of those eventualities. Before you second it, though, you should be aware the language anti growth law came directly out of uh, House Bill 23, 1255. This is not law, this is not language that, that the city staff made up. Remember, we didn't have any direction from city council on what city council might want to do. There, there were three options, clearly, three options. You can vote follow 1255, don't follow 1255. This ordinance is option three. Which, which is allowed for within 1255. And, and what this ordinance does is it picks up that language in 1255 that says, there may be some cities that have anti-growth laws and that's the language of the statute. I didn't make it up, but it says there may be some cities that have this, this kind of a law and they may need a little bit of time to transition. So this option is just picking up the language exactly out of the statute. I don't think you can go back and change or take the word anti-growth out because you'd be changing the language when, when every time we cited to the statute and use the statutory language, it says anti-growth law. So if you changed anti-growth law, basically we'd have to remove the, the uh, citations and make it clear that we were no longer citing to the statute, which changes the nature of, of the statute itself. So I understand why that is a distasteful phrase to you, but we were very carefully following the exact language of the law to make it very clear which section of the law was being invoked in order to give city council this, this third option. Okay, um, could, uh, by the way, it's already been seconded. Um, could we uh, change the wording somehow to like leave it as anti-growth parentheses um strategic growth would that be a big problem to it would that like um send off flares and fireworks and things like that if you would like to change the language within the very first uh recital which references uh the law that is currently known as residential growth limitations it may have been initially adopted as strategic growth limitations but it was codified as residential go growth rate limitations. And therefore, because that's its current name, that's the language that staff incorporated into this statute. If you wanna change that, or if you wanna add into residential growth limitations, initially known as strategic growth uh, initiative, or, or if you wanna throw it into that very first recital, um, that would be fine. Anywhere else, you would actually be changing the language of of the statute, which again, we we shouldn't be we shouldn't be doing that. Okay, I I, I change my motion to include what you just said. If the second wants to go along, second. So there it is. Um, could you read it back? Because I don't have it right now. <laughs> For proper procedure, don't we need to first reverse? It? Again, we, we need to kind of go backwards in in order. This yeah, so if Councillor Springsteen will take back the second, please. There you go. Second. Okay, and then Councillor Olver, will you? Right. I'm hoping that um, uh, Ms. McKinney Brown could tell me what I'm trying to say. <laughs> to amend the first recital to include the phrase strategic growth initiative after the words residential growth limitations. So council, you could say so moved. So moved. Okay, now I need a second. Yep, now you need a second. Anybody want to second that? Second, and and I hope we have some discussion about how how, how to word that. Well, it was just worded, and you just seconded it. Did you not want to second it? 
and change the wording. I believe that we could move ahead and, and have discussion about this, just like we've done with many other things. Where, well, I understand, where they, they I, Councilor, I'm just, Councilor, I'm just saying that your seconder wants to change the, potentially change the language. So maybe hold off on seconding and have the discussion about if you want to change the language that you just seconded. Yeah, but can we have a discussion without seconding? I would think it, it dies right there without a second. Well, I'm happy to give Councilor Springsteen the floor. And uh, it okay. is seconded. And so if you want to have the discussion, you can make either resend again or make a motion to the motion. I'm good with discussion. Yeah, my, my thought was just to clarify that the anti-growth language was specifically in the House bill and is not our language under the ordinance and that uh, we as a city do not define it as an anti-growth initiative, that that was the state's definition. So perhaps an amendment clarifying that language and that's why that language is in the ordinance in the first place. Okay, for housekeeping purposes, Ms. McKinney Brown, would it be better to just have that section put in if it's amenable to Councillor Olver? So that is codified rather than an additional piece. As I'm understanding it, Council Member Springsteen is suggesting she would like to add a recital to um, the top part of the ordinance explaining. Uh, additional information. And if any member of the city council wants to make that motion to to add an additional recital with additional information, that's fine. The last time you passed an emergency ordinance, it was you amended that emergency ordinance as well. So this is um, pretty common practice. So Ms. McKinney Brown, though, just for clarification, though, I think that both these objectives get to the same point, though, right? One is a recital and one is in the They're, body. Both, both are in the recitals. The recitals are just, it just explain the ordinance. The actual language of the ordinance is, is always underneath the now, therefore, be it ordained. So the recitals just explain the background and history. Um, the, the motion, as stated by Council Member Olver, is to just include the, the additional name of strategic growth initiative in the initial paragraph recital, which clarifies, I think it, it makes him uncomfortable that residential growth limitations, which is the current name of that law uh, exists and he would like to have the original name put in. So it could be put in right there. And then as I'm hearing council member Springsteen, she wanted a longer explanation, which would probably require an additional uh, recital. Okay. And and, then, it, and I and did then, second Councillor Over on the original thing we were discussing. So I think both would be um, the way correct. to go. That's why I was going to clarify though. Do we need two separate motions or can it all be incorporated under one? Uh, I think it would be cleaner for two separate motions. Okay. Uh, Seems good. Technically, maybe you could do it as one, but it, it gets really confusing when you are led, when you're writing law from the bench as to exactly what you said and what you meant. Correct. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. I still have, and this is on Councillor Olver's original. Mayor Pro Tem Strum, your hand is up. Is that to the motion? No. Okay. Councillor Springsteen, is this to the original motion or is that residual? Okay. We have a motion and a second. Please cast your votes. Okay, and that passes. AI, three nay, the nay being Stuart, Stuart, Vincent, and Charzai. All right, Councillor Springsteen, you want to make a motion? Yeah, 
Yes, I, I move to add a recital that clarifies that reference to anti-growth in our ordinance uh, was done merely to mirror language in the state house bill, but does not reflect what our strategic growth initiative actually is, which is not anti-growth. Is, is that before there's a just hold on real quick before there's a second is that the is that the bona fide language you want or do you want some help with that i'm i'm happy to defer to the city attorney on this as well i think her la her language is fine mayor i've i've written it out right so we got that so is there a second second Okay, there's a motion, a second. Councillor Franks, your hand went up on this one and then went down. Okay, Mayor Pro Tem. Okay, all right. So there's a motion, a second on the recital referring that uh, anti-growth is statutory language. Please cast your votes. Okay, and that, let's see. One, two, three, four. Five. One, two, three. So that passes six, five. The five nays being Strom, Vincent, Cherzai, Stewart, and Matt Carrero. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem Strom. My raised hand was back to the original ordinance is now the appropriate time we've moved around yes ma'am okay thank you i wanted to take a minute just to note that this the two years gives us the opportunity i believe to work thoughtfully through creating that path is best for all of our like liquid residents this is something that it's a significant shift and we're stuck in a really complicated place because we've got some concerns um, from residents over here that are concerned about how we grow where we grow where density is but we also have residents that are begging and asking for more legally defined affordable units workforce units we have organizations within our community, Red Rocks Community College is one of them, that's having a hard time finding workforce because they're having challenges living in the community that they would be teaching in. This is something that if we take that two years and really convene all stakeholders, and I'm talking about like, we've got families, we've got business, we've got community, to come up with the best tools. I believe we've got a lot of opportunity right now because we're actually already having conversations about the, the housing study that just came out that is working right now within the Housing Policy Commission. And we're launching later this month, the comprehensive plan. This gives us the opportunity to take this and drill down with those and actually hone in the tools that we're using, like around zoning to make sure that we're doing the right things in the right places. So the, or, the ordinance that we had originally in front of us tonight, um, I would support and I want to make sure that it's because we do know that we have very complex community needs that are on both sides that we really fundamentally need to sit down and figure out that best path forward. That's all I have. Great, thank you. Councilor Jansen. Thank you. Um, so I think 1255 was just a gross overreach by the state of Colorado and Governor Polis. And it's a problem that extends beyond the people's, the people's uh, Lakewood's, uh, the people of Lakewood's strategic growth initiative. Um, the subject matter could be a dozen other things besides planning and zoning. The excuses of politicians at the Capitol use to ram this House Bill 1255 through reflects that they don't care about local control, that they don't care about the voters' voice. So as, as city councilors, our residents need us to stand up. Option was one was the only um, was it was going 
Option one was to continue to enforce the strategic growth initiative and to refuse to recognize the shameless and audacious political power grab. That's why I supported that. Um, I just don't think I can support anything that has anything with 1255 in it. Thanks. Councilor Sherazai. Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, I'm having a really tough time getting behind this emergency ordinance because I, I feel like <clears throat> we've seen there's been publicity in recent uh, weeks, you know, that big Guardian article that I know a lot of us have read, um, you know, is showcasing even the co-authors of this uh, growth limitation are saying that it's not working. And so what happened in 2017 and 2019 are different times now when we're in a housing crisis. And I'm just having a real tough time moving through another two years of supporting something that has proven to have no positive results in getting us affordable housing. It does nothing to move us closer to those goals. In fact, it's done everything, I think, to move us in a different direction. And so for me, I don't know that I'm feeling confident in supporting another two years of punting this. You know, I think tonight, for example, you know, some of the conversations we're having are just we need to get to work for people to find solutions on on how we're going to get affordability in our community. We had a public comment earlier talking about the housing that was going in and mentioned during the Ward 1 meeting. That's 44 affordable units coming in. You know, we need to be supportive of things that like this that are happening and absolutely encourage our community to work with, in this case, Metro West Housing, which wasn't clear in that public comment. But we're not doing a great job of supporting that. And I think that by supporting this emergency ordinance, we just give ourselves two more years of living through this bad policy. Okay, Councillor Abel. Come on, me, my. Ah. You're on, we got you. No, okay, oh, thank you. Um, you know, for 10 years before this thing was passed, these folks came to city council and asked for what they wanted, and they were widely ignored. We didn't have the housing types that were called for in our housing studies. We didn't have any move toward affordability. And as far as I can see, we still haven't had any move toward affordability. The committee that was going to deal with inclusionary housing Housing had its knees chopped off. We have not, in fact, we have moved the affordable housing discussion to the uh, Housing Commission, where it was supposed to have been taken up last week, and oh yeah, we can't get to it again. So what we have done is make zero progress in four years toward affordable housing. And we have advocates for affordable housing setting in nearly every seat on city council. Why is that? Thank you. Councilor Older. Hi, I'm sorry, but I'm going to get a little tiny bit off topic, but it's already been taken off topic by others earlier. Um, the 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 um, legislative committee voted unanimously to oppose this bill, 1255, when uh, when we talked about it. And it's unclear now um, what Lakewood actually did about that. And I'm going to be, I just want to give fair warning that I'm going to be looking into that and bringing that up at future meetings. Um, but it really isn't germane to what we're talking about right now. But um since it's already been mentioned i thought i'd bring it up that yes we are looking into what lakewood did um about uh talking to our representatives down at the state house uh i know one of one of them um voted no on it and two of them at the of the representative our representatives voted yes uh i've heard things about how crested butte had went down and and got themselves um, exempted from 1255. And I think uh, as a post-mortem on this, we need to be looking at some of those things down the road. And so I'll, I'll, we'll come back to that, but that's something else. I just wanted to 
use that as my final thought. Thanks. And, and Councilor Orlov, I might just real quick, I don't think Crest of Butte was exempted. I don't, I think a matter of statewide concern means everybody is part of this. I think one of the mountain communities uh, made some protections in their affordable side, but I don't think anything was, anybody was exempted. And that was Crest of Butte, right? No, sir. I don't think so. Really? Okay. I'll have to check on that one. Next. Thanks. Councilor Springsteen. You know, I, I first wanted to just address that the idea that the voters voted on this a long time ago, therefore, we don't have to uphold that. I mean, they have they voted for a lot of us a long time ago. And it has to be upheld that we're still in governance. So so that's not a good argument. But I also wanted to 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 reference some community rights movements that I've seen. And here's a quote, the right to local community self-government serves as the foundation for the American system of law and is a central tenet of our Declaration of Independence and state and federal constitutions. The people's right to self-governance has been routinely ignored by our elected representatives and overridden by the courts in favor of corporate rights. That's Thomas Lindsay, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. And essentially over the last 200 years, corporations have manufactured a structure of law in which they have ever increasing rights and privileges today, allowing the preemption of community self-determination when corporate interests are at stake. Corporations prioritize maximizing profit typically for distant investors who have no connection to the community. Consequently, the best interests of the community and its environment are less important than corporate exploitation of natural resources. And where we see this in state and federal preemption is that there are laws that allow large corporations to force harmful activities into communities despite community opposition. All of you who vote to override our local law are voting for those corporate interests. And many of you were very much supported by them. So it's not a surprise to me, but it's very disappointing to both me and your constituents. Councilor Vincent. Yes, um, this is this is difficult for me because, as everybody well knows, and I've gotten chastised before, I had people from my ward wanting to know specifically how the SGI got passed, and it overwhelmingly got voted down in Ward Two. Um, but I've told those people that I have an obligation now whether I like it or not, to support what the voters want. Um, and this is this is difficult for me because I think we're all around. I, like um, my co-counselor, I'm not a big fan of the SGI, but I, I do have to listen to the, the city as a whole. I feel very, um, I, I don't like the idea that we could not ask questions where we could clarify, where we could get information. And I feel, I feel hamstrung, I'll be honest. And I couldn't even ask questions. I mean, I get disappointed when I hear that Metro West wants to build something and everybody's up in arms about it. Because I, I will tell this council, although they like that article that was in the Denver Post, I laughed out loud. I mean, I really laughed because what they showed as a picture for this um, growth, this unwarranted growth, was a picture of the mental health facility that's going to be for 40 people who are homeless with wraparound services. They didn't mention that, nor did they mention that we're kicking off 40 more units, 60, I think, 40 or 60, in two weeks, that's on 22nd and Wadsworth. So there is things happening that may go off a little bit, but I'm gonna support this because I think you need the time 
to carefully look at all the issues that are involved in this. I mean, right now, from what I've heard from this council, they want to look at green space. They want to look at design, et cetera. There's a lot of things that impact that right now. So I've always been one who says things do not move fast enough. But in this one, I, I got to compromise somehow and say that people need to come together. And there's nothing that says you have to take two years. doesn't say that anywhere in there. You can actually move these things through faster. So that's where I stand. Thank you, Councilor Elver. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to summarize and make sure that uh, I'm on the right page. So if we vote yes, uh, SGI basically sunsets in two years and goes down in between. Uh, if we vote no with a simple majority, this thing goes in. No, wait a minute, that's wrong. If we vote yes and there's a super majority, then SGI sunsets in two years and is in effect tomorrow. If we vote yes with just the majority, then there's going to be like a month where there's a problem um, and uh, I don't know, there's a bit of a problem. And if we no, vote no, SGI goes away tomorrow. Is uh, um, Ms. McKinney Brown, is am I, am I accurate or close? <laughs> if the ordinance passes by a supermajority, it will go into effect tomorrow. If the ordinance passes by a simple majority, it will go into effect, it'll go into effect in 30 days. But in order to, um, in order to follow the direction of the majority of the council, the uh, 1427 would not be enforced in the next 30 days that we would not be in violation of the law. If it fails, city council can take any other action. Uh, you, can, as you can make a motion to follow 1255 as it is presented. You can make another motion to not follow 1255. If this ordinance fails, um, it just falls back on city council to make a decision on what it is you want to see happen. This was just one of three options that staff was trying to make available to you so that you would have all possible options in front of you. I understand. Uh, it, I think we got down the road of a like the anti-abortion wording on that one. If you vote yes, it's no, but if we vote Yes, I know. I know. I know what it is. Thank you very much. Councilor Stewart. Yeah, thanks. Um, just in all transparency, as we're going through this uh, publicly, I want my constituents to know that I am also really struggling with this decision. I'm going to be honest, I don't actually totally know how I'm going to vote on this yet. <laughs> For a few reasons, um, you know, the wheels of government sometimes move slowly. Sometimes that can be really, really frustrating. Um, sometimes it's a positive thing. Um, I think it's a balance, you know. Um, I was hoping that my motion to really kind of light a fire under us as a city council to take responsibility and, um, you know, put something forward a little bit sooner and um, move up that timeline as a commitment to the community. Um, you know, I mean, obviously I'm disappointed that that failed and I realize that we don't have to take the full 24 months. Um, you know, it was more, it doesn't functionally change anything, but it was a public commitment, um, you know, on my part to, to do that. Um, so just want to state that, that just because that motion failed to the public doesn't mean that we can't uh, work on this faster. I want to say that we hear you. Um, you know, it doesn't just, if this potentially passes and, and ramps down over the course of the next two years, that doesn't mean that the concerns of our citizens went away. Um, and I recognize that. Um, I have constituents who are really concerned about being able to stay in their community and work in their community because they're getting pushed out by high rental prices. Um, and we can't build enough, um, you know, income-based housing fast enough. Um, 
you know, there are folks in our community like myself who really, really struggled to purchase their first home because there's just absolutely no supply. Um, and you're competing with so many other people to be able to, um, you know, set down roots and, you know, build generational wealth. Um, and I know that those are concerns. And I know that there are also concerns that a lot of my constituents have where in conversations right now um, about the aesthetics of some larger uh, housing projects that we need because we need, you know, more spaces for people to live that are affordable, but also recognize that they need to fit in with the character of the neighborhood and it's okay to have design standards and it's okay to have green space standards. Um, and so I just want to say to all of you that I hear you and I think sometimes it feels like some of those concerns and priorities are competing, but I don't think that they are. And I think that there's a way that we can move forward to really honor the needs and the desires of our community to continue to build a Lakewood where people can live, where people can set down roots, um, but that is also inclusive and where all are welcome. Um, and, you know, I sometimes that's going to take a little bit longer than we would like for it to, um, but at the same time, maybe it's a good idea to just hold ourselves accountable to that. So all that to say, I'm still struggling with this decision, but I just want my constituents to know that that's where I'm at. And hopefully that's because I'm hearing what you care about. Um, feel free to call me and email me tomorrow if that was not an accurate representation. <laughs> Councilor Springsteen. You know, I, a couple of misconceptions that I think are always out there about SGI. Um, you know, where I came from in supporting it originally was watching the displacement and gentrification of the neighborhood in Denver, where I grew up, where there was this great diversity, families of color, Black families, Hispanic families, Jewish families, all of that is gone now. It has all been replaced with these high end row houses. Everybody's the same color, everybody's upper middle class, everybody has a dog, nobody takes the light rail, even though it's a block away. That was what I wanted to avoid in Lakewood. And, and to oversimplify that people who support SGI are just NIMBYs or racists or whatever people say is, is totally off base because, you know, everybody's affected by this lack of affordable housing, no matter what, even if you have your own home right now, my brother can't live here. He has to live in another state. And that makes me really sad. We're all affected by this crisis. We all want to make it better. My best friend was homeless for 12 years. He has terrible stories of what he went through. I want to make affordable housing for the homeless. I, I think there's a bigger picture, which is the preemption of local rights that we need to look at because it sets a precedent what we do tonight. But beyond that, we owe it to our community to, to respect what they asked us to do as their representatives. We don't get to override it just because a couple of years have gone by. And um, I mean, I think it's as simple as that. And so my understanding of our vote, and please tell me if I'm wrong, is if we vote this down, this ordinance, we can then come back with suggestions on other things we could do, such as upholding our ordinance, our 14, our, our SGI ordinance. Um, if I'm wrong about that, please let me know because there seems to be a lot of confusion about 
if we vote this down, what happens next? So please help, thanks. So I'll ask for our attorneys to weigh in. This is one of three, there are three obvious responses to 1255. This is one of the three obvious responses, this ordinance. Uh, staff is is providing it to the city council so that you would be uh, have the option of of this third um, way to respond to 1255. If the city council does not want to respond to 1255 with this ordinance, you can certainly go in a different direction. Uh, one option is to direct staff not to follow 1255. One option is to direct staff to, fo to follow 1255 effective immediately. Um, I think someone stated earlier that what this ordinance does is eventually bring the city into compliance with 1255, but give the city some time to get there. So those are the three options. If this ordinance fails, you can still go back to one of the other two options. I think there's some confusion, though, Ms. McKinney Brown, because there was a motion that failed that said to continue to uh, enforce uh, Lakewood Municipal Code 1427 and to fail to recognize HB 231255 as a valid law of the state. That so failed. That one, yes. That that one failed. So that specific language cannot come back. But if a majority of the city council wanted to direct staff not to follow and they came up with alternative language about that um, and a majority followed it. At this point, what you have to do this evening is is come up with a direction, it, some direction. And um, the first ordinance failed, which suggests to those of us listening that uh, a majority of the council would not want to do option one. But again, you're making these decisions as you move forward, and I'm trying my hardest not to give you direction or limitations. So uh, if there is alternative language that would come somewhere near alternate option one or maybe combine option one or two, I don't even know what that would look like. We'd, we'd have to listen to it, I think, before we could just say no. Councillor Franks. But I just want to clarify, we still can't get legal advice on any of it. So right. we are we are back to a full circle moment. Thus, the uh, underlying issue for many of us where we are doing our level best without being able to explore the options. I want to keep stressing that because, again, we've tried this twice. It is very frustrating. I know we're all working very hard. Um, but again, we're working hard when many of us had a very long list of questions which would have um, been greatly beneficial to this discussion tonight. Um, I know that's not where we're at at the moment, but I'm going to keep stating it over and over again that that was to do nothing nefarious. That was to do everything to give us the opportunity to ensure we had a quality productive conversation that allowed every counselor to explore every option that they thought might have been viable to test it with other counselors um, and no votes would have been taken. So I'm just going to keep stressing that I'm certainly prepared to uh, do my my job tonight, but it has made been made very difficult uh, by not being able to get that quality uh, information and quality discussion with my fellow counselors. So we still have a motion in a second on the floor. Is there any other discussion on this one? Okay. Seeing none, we'll cast your votes on the emergency ordinance 2023-30. So that passes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight eyes three nays, the nays being Abel, Jansen, and Springsteen, which means that does meet the emergency threshold. Okay. Well, that is all that we have on our agenda for this evening. So I thank everybody and we'll adjourn this at 8.20 p.m. Thank you.